Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. Today, our focus takes us deep into the realm of thrombotic disorders and laboratory. We're set to explore a wide range of topics, including the etiology and prevalence of thrombosis, along with various thrombosis risk factors. Whether we're talking about acquired thrombosis risk factors, those linked to systemic diseases, or the intriguing world of congenital thrombosis risk factors and the double hit phenomenon, we've got you covered. Our journey will then lead us to the laboratory evaluation of thrombophilia. Here, we'll delve into essential aspects such as antiphospholipid antibodies, activated protein C resistance, and factor V Leiden mutation. And, of course, we can't overlook the significance of the protein C control pathway. If you're ready to uncover the mysteries of thrombosis, go ahead and hit that like button, and let's get started. Prevalence of Arterial Thrombosis Thrombosis is no simple matter, it's a complex disorder that arises from abnormalities in blood flow, the coagulation system, platelet function, leukocyte activation, and the blood vessel wall. This leads to the inappropriate formation of platelet or fibrin clots that obstruct blood vessels. Thrombophilia, the predisposition to thrombosis, can be either congenital or acquired. Theoretical causes range from physical, chemical, to biological events, including inflammation, inappropriate platelet activation, uncontrolled blood coagulation system activation, and suppressed fibrinolysis. From 2000 to 2010, the U.S. witnessed a decline in death rates from venous and arterial thrombotic diseases. However, thrombosis still accounted for one in three deaths in 2010. Shockingly, initial thrombotic events were fatal in 25%, and many cases went undiagnosed before autopsy. Annual incidence of VTE in the U.S. has remained constant for at least 25 years, affecting 1 in 1,000 individuals. It's more prevalent in African Americans and women of childbearing age. Deep vein thrombosis is the most common, causing symptoms like localized pain, heat sensation, redness, and swelling. Emboli, fragments of thrombi, can travel and lodge in the arterial pulmonary vasculature, leading to ischemia and necrosis of lung tissue. Shockingly, 95% of pulmonary emboli arise from thrombi in deep leg and calf veins. A significant number of cases go undiagnosed due to symptoms resembling heart disease or pneumonia. There's a familial distribution indicating a preference for deep venous thrombosis over pulmonary embolism. Mechanisms causing venous thromboembolism, VTE, include coagulation system imbalances, inappropriate activation, gain of coagulation factor function, inadequate control of thrombin generation, or suppressed fibrinolysis. Conditions like cancer, chronic heart, lung, or renal diseases are often implicated in VTE. Cardiovascular disease took a staggering toll, contributing to 380,000 premature deaths in the U.S. in 2010. Shockingly, Strokes played a significant role, contributing to 1 in 19 premature deaths before the age of 78. Now, let's talk numbers. Around 80% of acute myocardial infarctions and 85% of strokes result from thrombi blocking coronary arteries or carotid end arteries, respectively. Don't be fooled by the silence. Transient ischemic attacks and peripheral arterial occlusions, more common than strokes and coronary artery disease, cause significant morbidity. It's time to shine a light on these often overlooked threats. Arterial thrombosis often starts with unstable atherosclerotic plaques in vessel walls. Activated platelets, monocytes, and macrophages embed in fatty plaques, suppressing the release of normal antithrombotic molecules and exposing prothrombotic substances like tissue factor. The plot thickens. Ruptured small plaques occlude arteries, releasing mediators that activate platelets. Picture this. Platelets combining with von Willebrand factor to form arterial platelet plugs, also known as white thrombi. This process leads to ischemia and necrosis in surrounding tissue. Next we're diving into the intricate world of thrombosis risk factors. If you're curious about what might be affecting your hemostasis system, you're in the right place. Acquired thrombosis risk factors. Life habits and circumstances play a crucial role in either maintaining or damaging our hemostasis systems, influencing thrombosis risk. From age and immobilization to diet, lipid metabolism, and smoking, these factors interact in a complex dance. But wait, there's more. Conditions and diseases bring their own set of threats, with laboratory diagnostics offering valuable insights. 
Transient and chronic antiphospholipid antibodies, including lupus anticoagulant and anticardiolipin antibodies, may be lurking in about 1% to 2% of the population. Chronic APL antibodies up the ante, increasing the risk of venous or arterial thrombosis and leading to the ominous antiphospholipid syndrome, APS. It often accompanies autoimmune connective tissue disorders, adding layers to the complexity. Brace yourselves for the malignancies. Tumor production of tissue factor analogs raises the stakes in venous thrombosis, while myeloproliferative neoplasms like essential thrombocythemia trigger thrombosis through platelet hyperactivity. Acute promyelocytic leukemia. It can cause the chaos of disseminated intravascular coagulation, DIC. Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, a stem cell mutation gone rogue, is responsible for venous or arterial thromboses in at least 40% of cases. Talk about a unique culprit in the mix. Chronic inflammatory diseases add their twist to the tail, contributing to thrombosis through fibrinogen and factor VIII elevation, atherosclerotic plaque formation, and more. Diabetes mellitus, a dangerous inflammatory condition, raises cardiovascular disease risk sixfold. From congestive heart failure increasing the risk of venous thrombosis to untreated atrial fibrillation raising the stakes for ischemic strokes, each condition has its own role in this intricate web. But wait, there's a twist. Nephrotic syndrome creates protein imbalances leading to thrombosis, with potential hemorrhage complications. It's a delicate balance. Congenital thrombosis risk factors. If you've ever wondered why some individuals face thrombotic events, especially in unusual scenarios, you're about to uncover the secrets of congenital thrombosis risk factors. Clinicians keep their radar on for congenital thrombophilia in specific scenarios, think thrombotic events in young adults, occurrences in unusual sites, or a family history of thrombosis. It's like putting the puzzle pieces together. Thrombosis is like a complex dance involving both congenital and acquired conditions. Even individuals with congenital thrombophilia might experience events due to a unique blend of factors. It's a fascinating mix of genetics and environmental influences. In the 1970s to 1990s, a wave of diagnostic tools emerged, allowing clinicians to dive deeper. The antithrombin activity assay, protein C and protein S activity assays, APC resistance assay, and molecular assays for various mutations opened new doors in understanding congenital thrombophilia. APC resistance, found in 3% to 8% of Caucasians globally, is a critical player. Interestingly, it extends to Arabs and Hispanics but is nearly absent in African and East Asian populations. It can even be acquired during pregnancy or with oral contraceptive therapy. Meet the leading culprits, FVL mutation and prothrombin G20210A mutation. The FVL mutation takes the crown as the most common inherited thrombophilia, while the prothrombin mutation often surfaces in those with a history of deep vein thrombosis. Protein C, protein S, and antithrombin deficiencies collectively occur in 0.2% to 1% of the world population. Dysfibrinogenemia and abnormal fibrinolysis are still mysteries under investigation. The plot thickens. Now, let's talk about the double hit. Thrombosis often results from a combination of genetic defects, diseases, and lifestyle factors. It's like a plot twist where possessing a deficiency doesn't guarantee trouble, it's the convergence of multiple risk factors that opens the door to clotting. Picture this, a young woman with the FVL mutation has a 35-fold increase in thrombosis risk when starting oral contraceptive therapy. In the physician's health study, homocysteine MIA and the FVL mutation proved to be a potent combination, tripling and doubling the risk of idiopathic venous thrombosis, respectively. Laboratory Evaluation of Thrombophilia when it comes to suspecting thrombophilia, it's all about assessing the known risk factors. The cumulative risk of thrombosis is like a puzzle, and each positive result adds a piece. But here's the catch, whether these factors impact anticoagulant treatment during active thrombosis is another story. Timing is everything. Ongoing or recent thrombotic events and current anticoagulant therapy can play tricks on interpreting results. To ensure accuracy, assays for antithrombin, protein C, protein S, Factor 8, and LA should be conducted at least 14 days after discontinuing anticoagulant therapy. Now, let's talk about the fascinating world of antiphospholipid antibodies, APL. This family of immunoglobulins is like the detectives of the bloodstream, binding protein phospholipid complexes. LAs, ACL, and anti B2 GPI antibodies are their aliases, and we detect them through clot based profiles and immunoassays. 
chronic autoimmune APL antibodies often lead to antiphospholipid syndrome, APS. It's like a silent puppeteer, orchestrating conditions such as transient ischemic attacks, strokes, artery diseases, venous thromboembolism, and even recurrent pregnancy complications like spontaneous abortions. APL antibodies come armed with IgM, IgG, or IgA isotypes, making them versatile players in the immune game. Surprisingly, they don't directly bind phospholipids but target the proteins assembling on those phospholipid surfaces. The primary target? B2, GPI, with annexin V and prothrombin also in the lineup. The plot thickens as ongoing research explores how these antibodies, seemingly harmless in name, contribute to the grand scheme of thrombosis. It's a puzzle waiting to be solved. Clinical Consequences of Antiphospholipid Antibodies Join us as we uncover their presence, behavior, and the impact they can have on our health. Did you know that APL antibodies make a cameo appearance in 1% to 2% of individuals from all walks of life? But here's the plot twist, they take center stage in 5% to 15% of individuals grappling with recurrent venous or arterial thrombotic disease. Most of them develop in response to infections or certain medications, vanishing within 12 weeks. No harm done, right? Well, positive results may need a closer look to determine if they're sticking around. Enter the autoimmune APL antibodies, stealing the spotlight in collagen vascular diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and Sjogren syndrome. Sometimes, they emerge as solo performers, leading to primary antiphospholipid syndrome, APS. Brace yourselves, 30% of these antibodies are linked to both arterial and venous thrombosis. Their chronic presence, even without an autoimmune disorder, heightens the risk of thrombosis by 1.8-fold to 3.2-fold. APS, our mysterious protagonist, makes an entrance when faced with unexplained venous or arterial thrombosis, thrombocytopenia, or recurrent fetal loss. How do we uncover this? Specialized hemostasis laboratories step in, offering APL detection profiles. Think of it as a health detective's toolkit, including clot-based assays for LA and immunoassays for ACL and anti-B2 GPI antibodies. And watch out for LA, especially when an unexplained prolonged partial thromboplastin time, PTT, raises suspicions. We're unraveling the intricacies of the lupus anticoagulant test profile, a critical examination that clinicians employ when faced with potential clotting challenges. Stick around as we demystify the process step by step. First up, let's meet the contenders, the clot-based assays. These tests, with reduced reagent phospholipid concentrations, are finely tuned to detect lupus anticoagulant, LA. Our main stars include dilute Russell Viper Venom Time, DRVBT, and silica-based partial thromboplastin time, PTT, alongside their seasoned counterparts, Kalin Clotting Time, KCT, and dilute thromboplastin time, DTT. These 2009 guidelines give us a dance routine, a sequence of assays to detect LA. It's like following a choreographed set of steps. 1. A prolonged clot formation using a low phospholipid PTT or DRVVT. 2. Failure to correct when mixed with normal control plasma. 3. Adding a phospholipid-rich reagent to check for correction. 4. Ruling out other coagulation issues. Now, let's peek behind the curtain at the mixing study. This is like the main act, a performance requested by clinicians, especially when adverse thrombotic or obstetric events raise eyebrows. The study involves mixing patient plasma with control normal plasma, using a PTT reagent with intermediate LA sensitivity. Enter the heparin detectives, unfractionated heparin detection. This is crucial and is usually done with thrombin clotting time or a chromogenic anti-XA heparin assay during the mixing study. Time for a director's cut. The laboratory director plays a key role, determining the degree of PTT shortening considered as correction. It's like setting the standards for a blockbuster movie. Our mixing studies use platelet-poor plasma to ensure LA isn't neutralized by platelet membrane phospholipids. We also minimize freezing-induced platelet membrane fragments to prevent false negative LA results. It's an art, really. Process of performing clot-based lupus anticoagulant tests a crucial step in diagnosing potential clotting disorders. Join me as we break down the steps, making it easy to understand. Picture this as the prelude to a grand performance. When a mixing study hints at lupus anticoagulant, LA, it's time to initiate specific testing for confirmation. Our main act. The dilute Russell Viper Venom Time, 
DRVVT, considered the superstar of LASAs. If the screening result exceeds the normal plasma, NP, result by a predetermined ratio, LA is on the radar. Now, it's time for the confirmatory dance. An aliquot of the patient sample meets the DRVVT high phospholipid confirmatory reagent. If the ratio surpasses the threshold, LA gets its confirmation badge. But what if the DRVVT ratio was below 1.2? Enter the silica-based low phospholipid partial thromboplastin time, PTT. Similar steps follow, with results based on a predetermined ratio. The script isn't set in stone, various algorithm modifications exist. Some start with PTT, incorporate intermediate NP mixing steps, or throw in curveballs like kaolin clotting time, KCT, or dilute thromboplastin time, DTT. Institutions have their norms. Some directors opt for normalization using the mean of the reference interval, MRI, or NP value. It's like bringing harmony to the performance. Antiphospholipid antibody immunoassays. Stay tuned as we uncover the secrets behind these diagnostic marvels. Picture LA and ACL antibodies as the dynamic duo often coexisting in the antiphospholipid syndrome, APS. The anticardiolipin antibody, ACL, immunoassay takes center stage, standardized across labs, unaffected by various therapies or conditions. Imagine microplate wells coated with bovine heart cardiolipin, creating the stage. Test SARA, calibrators, and controls join the performance. ACL binds, and a color change under the spotlight indicates its presence. Results are expressed in GPL, MPL, or APL units, each lab setting its unique reference limits. Now, let's introduce the co-star, the anti-B2 glycoprotein I immunoassay. IgG and IgM anti-B2 GPI units take the stage, closely correlated with thrombosis. Positive results prompt an encore after 12 weeks to distinguish transient from chronic antibodies. When routine assays don't take the spotlight, the antiphosphatidylserine immunoassay steps in. Results equal to or greater than 16 IgG or 22 IgM units earn a positive nod, available from specialty labs. We're delving into the fascinating world of activated protein C resistance and the notorious factor V Leiden mutation. Join us as we decode the clinical importance and unravel the mysteries of the APC resistance clot based assay. Picture a dance between the activated protein C, APC, protein S complex, gracefully hydrolyzing activated factors 5 and 8. But, there's a twist, an unexpected mutation in the factor 5 gene, famously known as factor 5 Leiden. Factor V Leiden mutation, a genetic plot twist, substitutes glutamine for arginine at position 506 of the factor V molecule. This alteration slows or resists APC hydrolysis, leading to the persistence of resistant factor VA, a key player in the drama of thrombin production and, ultimately, thrombosis. With 3% to 8% of Northern European Caucasians holding the FVL mutation, it's time to acknowledge its prevalence and the associated threefold higher risk of thrombosis, 18-fold for homozygotes. It's no wonder APC resistance detection is a common screening practice in acute care hemostasis laboratories. Now, let's dive into the choreography of the APC resistance clot-based assay. Patient plasma takes the stage, mixed with factor V depleted plasma. PTT reagent joins the performance, and a three-minute incubation sets the scene. Watch closely as two mixtures undergo a calcium chloride treatment, revealing a normal ratio or a disrupted one, indicating APC resistance. Let's explore the performance characteristics of the activated protein C resistance test factor V depleted plasma takes the spotlight, compensating for potential deficiencies. The use of platelet-poor plasma ensures accuracy, and special reagents neutralize potential interferences. The plot thickens when confirming APC resistance with the factor V Leiden mutation assay. Molecular tests take center stage, determining not only the presence but also the zygosity of the mutation, a crucial factor in predicting thrombosis risk and crafting personalized treatment plans. Now, let's shift our focus to the prothrombin G20210A mutation. This genetic twist involves a change in the prothrombin gene, leading to elevated prothrombin levels and an increased risk of thrombosis. But the story doesn't end there, unraveling the prevalence and global variations adds complexity to the narrative. Diagnosing the prothrombin G20210A mutation isn't a straightforward task. Phenotypic prothrombin activity assays offer limited insights due to overlapping levels between normal and mutant prothrombin. 
It's a diagnostic maze that requires precision and understanding. Antithrombin, an unsung hero in our body's clotting symphony. Join us as we decode the secrets of antithrombin and its vital role in maintaining hemostatic balance. Meet antithrombin, once known as antithrombin-3 or ATII, a serine protease inhibitor, part of the serpent family. This multitasking superhero neutralizes various serine proteases, including the notorious thrombin, 2A, and others like 9A, 10A, 11A, and 12A. Antithrombin gets a power-up from unfractionated heparin, UFH, low-molecular weight heparin, LMWH, and synthetic pentasaccharide, fondaparinex. These allies enhance its activity, ensuring a robust defense against coagulation threats. Antithrombin holds the honor of being the first plasma coagulation control protein identified and routinely tested in clinical hemostasis laboratories. Its counterparts in the serpin family, including heparin cofactor 2, A2 macroglobulin, A2 antiplasmin, and A1 antitrypsin, add to the coagulation orchestra. But what happens when antithrombin faces challenges? Acquired deficiency lurks in conditions like liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, and prolonged heparin therapy. Congenital deficiency, found in 1 in 2000 to 1 in 1500 individuals, contributes to recurrent venous thromboembolic disease cases. Antithrombin deficiency comes in two main types. Type 1, affecting 90% of cases, involves reduced production. Type 2, the remaining 10%, stems from mutations causing structural abnormalities, rendering the molecules non-functional. Antithrombin, our clotting maestro, dances within reference intervals. In adults, plasma antithrombin activity ranges from 78% to 126%, with antigen levels between 22 to 39 mg per deciliter. These levels remain stable throughout adulthood, except during life's challenges, like pregnancy, and tend to decrease with age. How do we measure antithrombin's prowess? Enter the antithrombin activity assay, a duel between clot-based and chromogenic methods. While the clot-based assay has a long-standing history, most laboratories favor the stability and reproducibility of the chromogenic assay. Witness the dance of heparin-activated plasma antithrombin, irreversibly binding to factor 10A, in the quest for clotting balance. Now, let's shed light on the antithrombin antigen assay, a turbidimetric microparticle immunoassay. Watch as latex microbats coated with antithrombin antibodies reveal their magic. In the presence of antithrombin, particles form larger aggregates, and the rate of light absorption change becomes the key to unlocking antithrombin concentration. Beware the pitfalls. Oral anticoagulant therapy with Coumadin can cast a shadow, potentially masking mild antithrombin deficiency. So, the wise practitioner must tread carefully during the 10 to 14 days post-surgery or thrombotic events when antithrombin activity remains decreased. World of heparin resistance and taking a closer look at the fascinating protein C control pathway. Get ready for a journey into the dynamics of blood coagulation, it's going to be mind-blowing. Let's kick things off with a topic that might sound a bit complex but is crucial to understand, heparin resistance. Stick around because we're breaking it down for you. Prolonged or intense heparin therapy can sometimes lead to decreased antithrombin levels. This is especially true in cases of congenital antithrombin deficiency, and it's what we call heparin resistance. But what does that mean? Imagine you're trying to hit the brakes on coagulation with heparin, but the system isn't responding as expected. That's heparin resistance for you. In these cases, therapeutic or higher dosages of heparin may be administered without exerting an anticoagulant effect. And here's the tricky part, it might not be detected by the typical partial thromboplastin time, PTT, test. So, how do we confirm heparin resistance? This is where the antithrombin assay comes into play. It's a crucial test to confirm antithrombin deficiency in instances of heparin resistance. Once antithrombin deficiency is confirmed, the next step is addressing it. Enter thrombate 3, an antithrombin concentrate that comes to the rescue. It's like giving a boost to your body's natural defenses against coagulation gone haywire. Thrombate 3, making sure your anticoagulant superheroes are back in action. Now, let's shift gears a bit and explore the protein C control pathway. Think of this as the control center for maintaining the delicate balance between coagulation and anticoagulation. At the heart of this pathway is thrombin, a pivotal coagulation factor. But here's the twist, thrombin doesn't just promote clotting, it also plays a crucial role in preventing excessive coagulation. It's like having a superhero that can switch between offense and defense, depending on what the body needs. 
In situations where clotting could be harmful, thrombin binds to thrombomodulin on endothelial cell membranes. This transforms it into an anticoagulant powerhouse. Picture this as a molecular superhero putting on its protective suit to keep things in check. The magical moment happens when the thrombin thrombomodulin complex triggers the activation of plasma protein C, APC. Now, APC is our hero in breaking down factors 5A and 8A, slowing down the coagulation process. It's like having a cleanup crew that comes in to dismantle the potential clotting disaster. However, deficiencies in protein C or protein S can throw a wrench into this well orchestrated process. This increases the risk of recurrent venous thrombosis, not something we want. Imagine it's like the security system malfunctioning, allowing unwanted guests, clots, to make their way in. Now, let's shine a spotlight on protein S, a vital cofactor for APC. It circulates in plasma in either a free form or bound to the complement binding protein C4BBP. When bound to C4BBP, protein S loses its ability to contribute to the protein C anticoagulant pathway. This highlights the significance of free plasma protein S. During inflammatory conditions, elevated C4BBP levels can lead to increased binding with protein S, causing a proportional decrease in free protein S levels. Think of it as the body's response to inflammation affecting the delicate balance in our coagulation system. Understanding Protein C and Protein S, Key Facts and Reference Ranges Protein C and Protein S play crucial roles in our body's coagulation system, ensuring that our blood flows smoothly. Now, let's dive into some key points. First up, did you know that a heterozygous deficiency in protein C or protein S can elevate the risk of recurrent deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism? Studies show a 1.6 to 11.5 fold increase in risk, making these proteins true heroes in our health story. It's like having our own superheroes, right? But wait, there's more. Protein S deficiency is linked to transient ischemic attacks and strokes, especially in younger individuals. Now, let's talk numbers. The reference interval for both protein C and protein S activity and antigen levels is 65% to 140%. For those with heterozygous deficiencies, levels typically range between 30% and 65%. Understanding these ranges helps us gauge our health status. Remember vitamin K-dependent proteins? Well, protein C and protein S are part of this family. They exhibit similar half-lives as factors 2, 7, 9, and X. Now, here's an important point to note. During the initiation of Coumadin therapy, protein C activity may decrease more rapidly than other coagulation factors. This can potentially lead to Coumadin-induced skin necrosis. Watch out for signs like painful necrotic lesions preceded by severe itching. If you ever notice these, it's crucial to seek medical attention promptly. To mitigate the risk of skin necrosis, co-administration of LMWH or synthetic pentasaccharide with Coumadin is recommended for patients suspected of or known to have protein C deficiency until a stable INR is achieved. After surgery or thrombotic events, protein C and protein S activity levels may temporarily drop. It's like a brief pause in the protein performance. Don't worry, it's just a part of the healing process. Pregnancy, liver or renal disease, vitamin K deficiency, DIC, and oral contraceptive use can depress the activities of protein C and protein S. Quick heads up, assays for these proteins cannot reliably identify congenital deficiencies within 14 days after thrombosis or Coumadin cessation, during pregnancy, or in the presence of certain health conditions. It takes time for our body's systems to stabilize after certain events, so be patient and let your body do its thing. Homozygous protein C or protein S deficiency, on the other hand, results in neonatal purpura fulminans, a rapidly fatal condition. Immediate treatment with factor concentrates and lifelong Coumadin therapy is crucial. Let's kick things off with protein C assays. These tests are the detectives in the world of clotting factors, helping us understand both the quantity and quality of protein C in our system. There are two main players in the protein C assay game, chromogenic and clot-based assays. Each has its unique methodology, like characters in a thrilling plot. Imagine a chromogenic assay as a colorful dance with Protac, a special ingredient from the venom of the southern copperhead serpent. It activates protein C, and we measure the activity of the resulting APC by looking at the intensity of a colored product. While chromogenic assays are fantastic at spotting abnormalities in the active serine protease site, they might miss issues with phospholipid or protein S binding sites. What a plot twist! 
But what if chromogenic and immunoassays show normal results, yet clinical conditions screen protein C deficiency? Enter the clot-based protein C assay, our hero in revealing abnormalities at additional sites on the protein C molecule. The clot-based protein C assay is like a choreographed performance. We mix patient plasma with protein C depleted normal plasma, throw in PTT reagent, protac, heparin neutralizer, and calcium chloride. The interval to clot formation is measured, and the prolongation tells us about protein C activity. Therapeutic heparin concentrations above 1 IU slash ML may throw a curveball at our accuracy. And here's the plot twist, conditions like APC resistance, lupus anticoagulant, and therapeutic direct thrombin inhibitors can influence the PTT, potentially leading to false elevation of protein C activity in clot-based assays. Protein S assays, unlocking the secrets of our clotting superheroes. Get ready for a roller coaster of assays, clot formations, and some cautionary tales. Similar to its companions, antithrombin and protein C, screening for protein S deficiency requires a functional assay. Unfortunately, there's no chromogenic shortcut for this one. Enter the clot-based assay, a hands-on performance by our laboratory practitioners. They mix the patient's plasma with protein S depleted normal plasma, creating a stage to maintain normal levels of factors other than protein S. APC and Russell Viper Venom join the scene in a buffer with a heparin neutralizer. Calcium chloride follows suit, and we hit record on the interval to clot formation. Prolonged results. That's our cue for higher protein S activity. And guess what? The clot-based protein S assay can be automated for efficiency. Caution is needed with therapeutic heparin levels exceeding 1 IU slash ML. They can be hungry heparin monsters, consuming the neutralizer and leading to an overestimation of protein S activity. Conditions like APC resistance, lupus anticoagulant, and the presence of therapeutic direct thrombin inhibitors may cast their shadows on the PTT, causing potential false elevations in activity levels in clot-based protein SSAs. Oh, and don't forget about prolonged refrigeration. It might activate coagulation factor 7, playing with protein S activity estimation and affecting prothrombin time-based coagulation factor assays. Now, let's talk about the investigative side of things when suspicion arises, enzyme immunoassays for protein S antigen. Think of it as a detective's toolkit. These assays measure both total and free protein S antigen, effectively detecting most quantitative congenital deficiencies. Enzyme immunoassays play detective even further. In cases of qualitative type 2 congenital deficiencies, where antigen levels are normal but activity is decreased, there are Sherlock Holmes. In type 3 deficiency, the plot thickens. The concentration of free antigen protein S and its activity are reduced, but not total antigen. Plasma C4 BBP concentration, measured with a research-only immunoassay, becomes our classified document. Stay up to date with our latest videos by hitting that subscribe button and activating notifications. Be the first to know when we release new and exciting content. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself, share this video with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.